the music and do the prizes, all the other prize giveaways. And then six to seven is the Polynesian show. I, I don't know what's going to be in, what we're in store for, but it should be pretty cool um, amongst other, other things there. And then after that, 7 p.m., yeah, so we're done. So, um, yeah, we'll get. Oh, yep. Oh, Amazon. Okay, so quick, we're okay. Okay, again, I'm going to announce it one more time. We're going to do a, a specific raffle for the Amazon challenge. So if you have one of these, go see Nani and Allison to get your special raffle ticket. And then if you solve the challenge, uh, challenges and don't have one of these, go see the Amazon guys to get one so that we can do the raffle. And we'll probably do the raffle right after Chris's talk. So the last talk, we'll do that raffle. So it gives you some time. So uh, Daniel, I've known Daniel for a long time. Um, whenever, uh, whenever I have PCI-related questions, he's my go-to guy. Like he does PCI stuff all over the world, and I mean all over. Uh, you name it. Um, uh, he's just a good guy. Loves to scuba dive. Uh, drives a little Lotus. Do you still have a Lotus? No. Oh, okay. Had a Lotus when he's living out here, um, which I think you could fit in your pocket. Close. Real close. close. Yeah. So. Um, but uh, a, a broad, really broad level of experience, very, comes from a very technical network and engineering background, and has done the whole gambit. Uh, and and when, when there's a, a time to give a talk on like management level security issues and challenges, there's pretty much nothing that he hasn't seen. So uh, please give me a, a warm round of applause for Daniel. Here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna be the epitome of traveling light. This is how I present these days. This is all I carry, so hopefully I don't commit suicide and manage to get stuck in some position because I've done that before. But I'm going to talk about what a lot of us always have these water cooler conversations about, which is, man, if I would have been the CSO, if I were only the CSO, if I had that title of CSO, what I'd be able to do. And I want to give you some stories. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, who I am, what this all came about from. I also want to talk to you about what we found to find successful CFOs, or CSOs, management. What those definitions were. What are the mistakes that we make in trying to lead a security program? What are the successes that we found as we've done the case studies, as I've been looking at successful CSOs and what they've done properly. And then a little summary and a little Q&A at the end. Um, who I am, Daniel Blander, 24 years in IT and InfoSec, um, I'm old, okay? Sorry, but I am old. I refuse to admit it. I still do have another Lotus in my running. Um, applications engineer, system engineer, network engineer, consultant, and I have been a CSO. So I know what the pain is on both sides of the fence. A uh, couple of fucking four-letter acronyms. Sorry, did I say that? Yes. Um, shameless plug, I'm the organizer of B-Sides Los Angeles. Free conference, all right? If any of you want to come out, even if it's your first time, you've never spoken before, please come. This is a community event. There's no charge for it, no obligatory requirements, except come out and participate, all right? Shameless plug, I'll do that all day. Come talk to me if you got questions. I started as an architect. I have a bachelor's of architecture. I did buildings. I have a few buildings around the world that are actually mine. So, bizarre trip to get to where I am, but very different perspective. This is gonna be relevant as we talk about it. And what I've been doing since about 2007 is doing research into what makes a successful CSO. It started out with some surveys that I did and some conversations that I had. And one of the most important ones that I had was I was in a country called Slovenia. Anybody know where Slovenia is? All right, we got some people. I was running a company in Slovenia. And I went to go pick up somebody from the airport in Ljubljana. He was the CSO for one of the country divisions of a major bank in the region. And I picked him up and he was talking about his new role. He said, you know, I just recently got appointed to 
be the CSO for this bank. And he said it was great. You know, the corporate governance group, the lead CSO, called me up, and we call him the grandfather. It's kind of this older gentleman. He's been around the block. He knows a lot about security. He called me up, and I was you know, really surprised. Here's the grandfather calling me up. He said, "Congratulations on your new job. If you touch the keyboard again, you're fired." Anyway, shoot. All right. What does that mean? And it started a conversation and started this whole thought process. Here I've been doing research on successful ways to make organizations, successful ways to get CSOs to think and act and behave, and what are some of the indicators. And here was an elder gentleman who gave the perfect statement. What is different about being a CSO from being an engineer in the trenches? We think too much about the technology about it. In reality, what I found that as I've interviewed about 100 CSOs, literally from all over the world, is that it's not about the technical skills. Don't get me wrong. The hacking kung fu that you've got is awesome. Do not lose it. I've lost a lot of it. I pick it up once in a while. But that's not what is going to win you into the leadership part. What's going to get your organization to change their attitude about security. There are very different things that do that. How do you define success? Good old Albert had a nice definition for it, and I really like it. He, part of that is value. What value are you giving to the organization? Do they really care about that value? Is it important for them? I reached out to all of these hundreds of CSOs that I knew, and asked them, what are the things that you would say make a successful CSO? Their responses were executive support. How many of you can say that you've got your executive support at the very top of your organization? Cool, we've got a couple of people. Hey, self-employed, great way to get that support. How many of you have support across your organization? So different parts of your organization actually come to you and ask for your help, ask for your opinion. I see a couple, I see a couple more, good. How many believe that they've got a good balance of risk and the business? Anybody? I see one. How many believe that they have effective communication they're able to talk with everybody. I see one, I see two, good. How many believe that they're included and listened to in strategic meetings? New business plans, new product service, new offerings, things are coming out. Are you part of those meetings? All right, I see a couple out there. That's excellent, it's really important. And it enables collaborative problem solving. How many of you think that you do this well? We do it, we do it well. We're going to talk about these. These are all the criteria that all these CSOs, and it was funny, I talked to them in one-on-one, -on -one, and it was amazing. Every single one of them said virtually the same thing. They might have used a different word or two, but the list was almost identical. Almost identical. And we're talking Fortune 500s to small healthcare providers to large technology firms, you name it, all of those companies gave me the same response. That's how they felt about it. What are our mistakes? Eric Copperthwaite is the CSO for Providence Health in Seattle. And just last week I talked to him and he gave me this great quote. Read it carefully. How many of you feel you do your job through influence, not through being authoritarian? I want to raise them high. I want to see those hands high. I see about four or five hands. Six. It's really important. Let's take some couple of examples. I call this the wombat syndrome. Does anybody know what a wombat is? What's a wombat? 
That's a wombat. Well, you think it's that furry marsupial? No, no, no. Wombat is a waste of money, brains, and time. Spell out with me. Waste of money, brains, and time is a wombat. I've got a whole hour-long lecture on great wombat quotes. Uh, wombats hang out in wombat caves with nice wombat furniture. They're really good at PowerPoint, things like that. Cause is usually something called professional deference. I can't say this, words are French speakers. It's actually a French term. Meaning we tend to look at the world from the perspective of our profession. We look at the world from the viewpoint of information security, or risk, or business continuity, or making money, or finance. We look at it from our perspective. Well, in information security, we're always thinking about how we can do things, how we should do things based on security. We need to force the users to do this. By the way, these aren't fake made up quotes. These are real things I wrote down at meetings. If I were in that meeting, I would have told them what their problem is. We've never said that, right? Never. It's not my job. It's their responsibility to fix it. And I would add to that, to know how to fix it. How many of us in security have told this to their programming or development groups? or complain behind closed doors about their programming and development groups this way. <coughs> You're lying. You're lying. Yes. Yep. Yep. No one will say, let's share, let's talk about it, let's figure it out together. No, it's your job. I have a contract I'm working right now. I watch people sit in their office place the phone call and say, this is your job to do. Hang up and go, great, when are we going to lunch? Ah, piss me off. The CSO must report to the CEO, damn it. I like that one because it's a little insightful. It's not necessarily true. So what happens when you do this? You're going to break people's trust. They don't trust you because you're being authoritarian. They're not going to respect you because you're not thinking of what they're trying to achieve. What are their business objectives? What are the things that are going to get them their bonus? So remember, they have a family to pay for too. They have college bills. They have food. They have other hobbies and things that they want to do. And you're telling them they have to do their job a harder way to achieve those things? You know, yeah, right. I, why should I follow that? That's not what my boss told me to do. They're not going to appreciate the communication if you've got that authoritarian approach. They're not going to collaborate because being authoritarian is anything but collaborative. What happens? You're in job search mode. A CIO who has a three-year lifespan, what's the lifespan of a CSO? Shorter than that. So find your role. Anybody seen this quote before? It's out on the Twitters. I love it. I absolutely love it. Security is about eliminating risk. Business is about taking risk to make money. See how those are a perfect match. It requires a different perspective. When you're going to be the CSO, the first thing you have to do is figure out what is your role. What is the purpose in your position within the company? What are your tasks? What are the things that you need to achieve? I sat with a company, a customer. PCI was the objective. This was a small hospitality company. They had a winery, they had a resort, a little wine club, things like that. Me, you have to fix everything. It's PCI, come on, it's all or nothing. It's you know, this big block of 256 controls, or you fail and pay fines, right? That's how PCI works. Owner, but I don't see why. That's a lot of money. Why should I do that? You know, it was going to be about two hundred thousand dollars to fix everything, which included full-time employees, things like that. Their IT department was one person. Always fun. But, but you have to do it. Come on, PCI. Look, documents, papers, all this stuff. Why? What if I don't? I take risks all the time. And his quote. 
I don't need to go to Vegas to gamble. I gamble with my business every day. I stopped in my tracks and I said, hold on, I just put on the wrong hat. Let me throw off that PCI hat and put the other one on. It's one of those <clears throat> smack me in the head, I went off track, I went off trail for a moment. And I realized he was right. Here's a company that would probably be seriously impacted if they followed every single letter of the law. I said, all right, I'm going to take my PCI hat off now, and I'm going to readjust. All right, let's talk again. He said, great, here's how much money I want to spend on it, and I'm willing to spend on it. Tell me what I should do. I said, okay. Disclaimer, and on we went. Think about it. Every one of us gambled every single day. I gambled all afternoon. I left my car keys on the back table. It's a rental car. I don't care if anybody steals it. I'm covered. It's a gamble I take. Business continuity presentation. Excuse me if it sounds a little bit trolling or pokey, but a lot of those things, you just got to take the risk. In this case, this guy said, you know what? I'm just going to take the risk. What's going to happen? I get a fine. I pay it. It's still going to be cheaper than me doing all of this stuff. I'll take that shot. It's a business decision. We have to accept that it's not our risk tolerance that matters. It's the person who owns that risk. As long as they look at that risk, understand it, have been very clear and open about it, have examined it, not buried it under the covers and completely ignored it. If they've really spent some time to understand it, then you can say, you know what? You've accepted. That's it. That's the business's choice. We have to be ready to accept that. So find your role. The mistake is to have that preconceived perception that it has to be a CSO. That's the only way we can do it, have a CSO. That's the mistake. The reality is if you want to do it correctly, the organizations that I talk to had an enterprise risk management function. Does anybody in their company have an ERM function? Anybody? Has anybody ever done or seen enterprise risk management? Heck, see about three hands out there. Look at enterprise risk management. This is equal. If you think about how business continuity and disaster recovery are related, DR is really about recovering and IT infrastructure. Business continuity is about the whole organization. What do you do if there is a pandemic? What do you do if there's a natural disaster? All those things. What do you do with personnel, with your business processes, all that? Take that relationship. It's the same relationship to InfoSec to enterprise risk management. ERM includes audit, business continuity, physical security, legal. All the aspects of everything that can cause an issue with your organization. A great description. Enterprise risk management includes such things as economic downturns. What is the impact of an economic downturn to the organization? If you think about it, that can be a far bigger impact than any breach. TJX, what happened to their stock price after the breach? A year later, it was up 50%. What happened in the economy to TJX? Far more impactful to the business. So those are the things you have to consider. What happens is you get a collaborative definition of risk. You get people to get together. All the different parts of your business, because each one has their own sets of risks. If you're a manufacturer and you have logistics, things getting shipped in, their risks are around what happens if I have a delay in the supply chain? What happens if boats get backed up? What happens if there's a strike? And they're going to know those down cold. One organization I worked at, we actually went out and did a survey of every different business unit. And we asked them, what are the biggest things that keep you up at night? They knew those issues Old because they work them all the time. In the case of the logistics, they knew every single risk of importing goods into the country. In the case of the finance department, they knew every one of the risks to their different accounts. The insurance guy, the treasurer, who managed that, knew every one of the insurance policies, what was covered and what was not. 
They know this stuff. Let them bring it out. Bring them together and let them talk about it. And guess what? In that process, you're going to understand what is important in IT to them. What is important in information to them. What is important in the assets they have, whether it's physical, whether it's logical, whether it's a business process they're worried about. And how a role of a CSO can play in that arena, what you can help them with. If you're not doing it as a whole organization, you don't have that coverage. So be very careful to look at it from an enterprise perspective. You're going to now have a great way to define the role of the CSO. And everybody will believe in it because they will realize, hey, I need this to fill these gaps that I've got, the holes in my processes, the risks that I have. Organizational structures that we've seen work, based on the surveys and the conversations I've had, the more mature organizations have a chief risk officer. It's someone who has distributed the engineering and the operational functions of security to other groups. Antivirus goes out to desktop or server groups. There's no reason to have a security group to do that. Let them understand that is their responsibility to do. Managing a firewall. For the most part, every organization I go to has already distributed that to network groups. They know all the routing, they know all the access control lists going on, and it's devices that they know. Do you want to hire a bunch of another bunch of guys who know an iOS or a Junos? No, you want to have certain resources that you're not replicating over the organization. CR now becomes an evangelist, a consultant, drives policy requirements and measures and validates that those are being followed. Tests for things, drives programs, but doesn't necessarily operate the engineering and operational tools. And executes as part of an ERM group. And notice I said this is part of a mature organization. These are organizations where everyone understands that security is important. You've already got that executive support. There's nothing at all wrong with saying, you know what, we're not at that point. We still need, whether it's called IT security, whether it's called a CSO and ISO, name doesn't matter. It's a role that fits to fill the gaps in the risk management that the organization says that they need. Don't get hung up in the title. It's to fit a role, a need. Remember Einstein? It's about the value that you bring. Maybe it owns engineering and operations. Better to try and distribute it. Get those groups to accept the responsibility for that security. And executes as part of the IT organization. It's okay. But choose the one that fits the organization. Second point that we found that was important, as I did the research and looked at the organizations that were successful, communication. This one should be pretty obvious. If you can't have someone to listen to you, and if you can't listen to them, you're not going to have good communication. Two ears, one mouth, what proportion do you use them? Think very carefully before you answer. Be the great communicator. Bad communication is that quote I used before. They should know what to do. Come on, developers, why don't you know how to code securely? Every organization that I've consulted at, it's because no one has sat down and told them. They've lectured them from afar. They've never sat down and told them. When I sit with them, and I am not the greatest person to be telling, people, tell, uh, telling developers, how to write secure code. I never wrote a line of code in well. I wrote Perl stuff, that's about as far as I got. But I'll tell you, spending the time to help give them pointers, show them things to look at, research to do, I suddenly became that expert. And they came to me, and they continue to come to me, even if I'm no longer working at that company, because I communicated about that stuff. Speak at your audience's level talking to an executive team, don't talk about TCP, IP, SIN, stateful connections and all that other fun stuff and, and flame connections and how big it was. 
They're going to gloss over in about two minutes. They're going to think that you're worthless to the organization. They're going to discredit you and push you back into the IT organization. Just like with developers, don't talk about elements of security of writing code in the beginning. Talk of them in the language of what they're going to understand. A great example, one of the people that I talked to, one of the CSOs, had been the CSO for UBS based out of Switzerland. They cover all of Europe and the Middle East. They had to have a conversation with their organization about how developers were having code that was crashing, and the administrators had to log in as a group all the time to restart the process. Already sounds bad, doesn't it? Bad code that crashes, root logging in, logging in as root, as root, with root passwords, just simple, basic stuff that you shouldn't be doing. But the business said, we need to have this. The communication that they had, they didn't talk in terms of, this is a security issue, you've got to go fix it. Instead, what they did is they said, look, isn't it a pain in the butt to always have an administrator around whenever this job runs? I said, yeah, it is, because you know, it could be weird hours they run this, this little report that they kick out all the time. I said, well, what if they made it automated so that the, the person who ran that report could simply restart it on their own? And it wasn't because the report was buggy. There were some other issues. And you know, there's all kinds of questions get out. But I said, what if we just let the users restart it? What if we got the administrators to be able to go home? Administrators' language, the administrators' thought process, they now got to go home and not have to deal with a simple user error problem. Think about how you're communicating. The medium is the message. How many times when you communicate with your people are you sending it via email? Be honest. How many of you text all of your friends? How many of you do more texting than phone calls? I'll talk and get you in contact with my 19-year-old daughter because that's all she does. She never uses her phone plan. <laughs> the medium is the message. How many of you know what percentage of your communication is body language? Anybody? 80, 70 percent? Yeah, roughly about that. If I go up to somebody and say, hey, I love you, versus if I walk up to somebody and say, I love you. <laughs> I got the same reaction in San Francisco, so <laughs> my wife loves it. Very different. Body language is important. It's the reason I am not behind the podium when I talk. Hint to any other speakers. It's important. You send an email, you're getting a fraction of what you're trying to say across to people. When I go and work at clients, I refuse to sit there and send emails to everybody. I walk around, I drive them nuts because I'm in their face. I'm talking to them, I'm meeting with them. I manage by walking around. That medium is your message. If you hide behind the email, you're not going to get the message out. But I'll tell you something else. You get out and meet them, even just say hi, talk about the crap, it doesn't matter. Be there. Suddenly you build a relationship with them. Something Stephen Covey calls intellectual capital. Build that intellectual capital. There's also something called mirroring. When you start to associate with someone, they trust you. There's a funny, funny exercise. I've seen Tony Robbins do it over and over and over and over again, and it works every single time. I've done it myself with my own teams that I've been coaching. Suddenly you have a camaraderie that you don't even expect to have. They're willing to listen to you. Align what you do with what you say. Now, we can't always do this perfectly. Ask people to correct you and call you out when you're saying something you're not doing it yourself. Likewise, the security processes that you tell your people in your organization that they must do, make sure you're doing them yourself too. You've got to have that AV turn on. Well, why don't you? You've got to have the security control. Well, why don't you? You're not setting the example. You also won't experience the same pain. There's probably a reason you're not doing it. 
oh, it's a pain in the butt. Well, gee, if it's a pain in the butt, why do you have it in, the pla in place anyway? Think really carefully about that. Better communication. Anything you say probably has a layer of inference to it, an assumption you've made. Hey, flame is a risk to us. Why? Tell me why. Jay Jacobs has a great principle he uses as his risk analysis. I love it. His answer to every question is, so what? He'll drive you crazy. He'll tell him something, he'll go, so what? And you have to respond. Be willing to have those inferences made explicit and to have someone question them. It's okay. All you're doing is taking an idea and making it better. It's not putting you down personally. Don't take it as a personal attack. It's a correction of an idea. Allow those ideas to be challenged. Test any of the competing views that are presented to you and what their impact would be. If there's a control that you think should go in place or a security change or something that you want to put in place, and somebody says, that's just ridiculous. It's going to do all this stuff. Test it. What if we did something else? Test that as well. It's okay. Good problem solving takes time. It does not happen in an instant. There are no simple problems, and there are no single answers. Do so in a blameless environment. This is the tricky part. Because we tend to get wrapped up in the ideas that we present. We take them personally. We think, this is mine. Try and separate yourself from this. This is a diff difficult process to put in place. But if you take away that blameless element, you can make a very big difference in allowing people to challenge ideas. CSO for a company in Austin, Texas, I met a couple months ago, said one of the things they do for the development teams is they make them, when they start their projects, list out all the possible risks. And then when they get to the end of the project, the end of their development cycle, is list any residual or leftover risks that they think are in their code or in the program. And what they say is, if you bring it out now, I don't care if it's the end of your coding, if it's mistakes you made or holes you know or things you weren't able to fix, if you bring it out now, you are without blame if it ever happens. If you do not bring it out and you hide it, obviously there are always those things you don't know you don't know, but if you know it but hide it, you will be blamed. So bring them out. They're encouraged. They bring out all kinds of crazy risks and issues. And guess what? It goes into another development cycle. They measure those risks. They evaluate those risks. And it's a very open, blameless organization. I was very impressed with talking to their people. Think about if you did that. Those risks are going to be there whether people admit them or not. Wouldn't it be better if they admitted them? And if it wasn't their fault if they found them? Think about that. Empathy, to lead people, walk beside them, care about what these people care about. I always use the example here in Hawaii. I loved it when I was working here, always do, because the family atmosphere, the grouping, how the people work together, they really cared about each other, at least the people that I worked with, and I was very, very impressed with the skills of the people that I met. Every country I've gone to, I've been to 36 countries, probably a few people here have been to more of the 36 countries I've visited, and in every one, the culture interests me, and I try to develop an empathy for what they value. <coughs> try and build that, because what you're building is that emotional capital that I mentioned earlier. What people want, you're understanding what people's motivations and their priorities are. Anybody ever read Maslow? Can anybody tell me what the basic need that Maslow presents is? Anybody remember them? I'll give you a simple, there's a hierarchy. I'll give you a simplified version. This is a very simplified version of it. 
There are four basic needs. There is a need for certainty. Something is certain. I know that if I step outside that door, I'm not going to explode. I have oxygen to breathe. I have food to put in my mouth. If you're homeless, you don't have some of those certainties. We like certainty of having a paycheck every week, or certainty of, of knowing that your wife and your loved ones are going to be nearby and you can talk to them. But then certainty gets a little bit boring, and you want